happy Tuesday, everybody. Thanks for joining us to geek out over the latest Guardian Essential poll with my partner in crime, Catherine Murphy. My name is Peter Lewis. I'm a director at Essential, one of the proud sponsors of Australia at Home, which has now been going for 12 weeks through this remarkable little moment in history. We set this up to be a place where we could share ideas and support each other. During lockdown, I feel that we're kind of starting all to come up for air and the project is probably moving towards its next iteration. We'll have a bit more to talk about that next week. Before we get cracking, um, recognise that we are all, wherever we are in Australia on Indigenous land, I'm on the Gadigal land of the Aura people and I pay my respects to Elders past, present, emerging, recognise the land we're on was never ceded. Um, I, I can't believe we've got any first timers today. In fact, we did a little bit of a blast just about an hour ago for people that have been to a previous session just to say, come back and spend some time with us. And it seems a few of you had. So you all know the drill. Use the chat, use the speaker. If you can put your camera on and keep it all nice. Um, we'll put a video up later in the day that um, people that have missed out might, might want to watch as well. So um, 12 weeks three months almost um you know history has been made and it feels like it's been a year of dog years catherine that you know the bushfires was probably two and a half years ago um parliament was you know i think the two week sitting that you're just in the middle of is probably like a an, a year in in federal politics and you know it wasn't as if the <laughs> pandemic was enough you've come back to parliament and you've got a scandal a labor branch gate and you know if you think back to the good yes. old days, it, it, keep, yeah, it keeps yeah, things yeah. fresh, yeah, yeah. doesn't it? So what's going on there and has that had any impact? I know it's largely a Victorian story, but um, it's like a house of cards, isn't it? The Labor Party and something that happens in Victoria like this does have implications. Yeah, yeah it does have national implications. Yeah, as you say, uh, and hello everyone, welcome. Um, Yes, it sort of has been the most extraordinary year in terms of, um, you know, feels like it should be December already, but no, um, uh, we're only mid-year. And yeah, we have come back this week uh, in the parliamentary sitting to the controversy about Adam Somurek and whether or not there has been a sort of bunch of industrial scale branch stacking in Victoria. Now, yeah, you're right, Peter, it's predominantly a state story, but uh, the it, it certainly ricocheted through politics here yesterday, um, the Labor MPs, uh, you know, lots of chat about uh, how that the 60 minute story, how the story came to pass, um, what uh, the implications would be uh, of Somurek uh, being sort of moved out of, uh, out of the Labor Party with alacrity by the Premier. Um, there are implications at this end for the power structures at this end. So uh, I think it's fair to say there was a high level of attention uh, given to those developments yesterday. Uh, and the national executive is moving towards uh, a fairly substantial, by the looks of things, intervention in the Victorian branch. So it's quite interesting. And is it just sideshow or is there any import? So as someone that covers national politics, is this a yarn? <laughs> well, it's sort of funny, Peter, like you said, uh, you know, both of us might suppress a small eye roll um, with branch sacking being a new kind of um, thing of note. Obviously, uh, stacking branches is sort of endemic in politics, sadly, and, and something that happens uh, in both major political parties. So um, is it a yarn? Yes, I think it is, because uh, obviously what's been going on in Victoria is, uh, well, one, the scale of it that appears extraordinary. Two, uh, obviously there was some very, very disturbing, there was some very disturbing footage uh, aired by 60 Minutes about some of the practices around it. Uh, you know, it speaks to party culture, it speaks to power brokers who are interested in creating fiefdoms and not particularly interested in, you know, governing the country, all of that sort of stuff. And yeah, in terms of the federal dimension, well, I think, like I said a minute ago, there are implications for federal Labor figures flowing from this uh, in terms of the alignment of power within the branch. 
and these things still matter. We might sort of think that they're process stories and they're a bit inter sign and and you know does does you know who cares? Who cares? Well, um, here I care because that impacts their where they sit in the firmament. It impacts pre-selections potentially. It impacts voting in in major ballots in the Labor Party. Um, but it's sort of um, I, I think too because you know. <laughs> Because branch stacking type stories, for one of a better genre of stories, are kind of endemic. Everybody just kind of roll, roll eyes, move on, right? Everybody does it. It sort of takes a big instance like what we've seen in Victoria to focus collective minds on that 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 culture and that practice. And um, and I think periodically we kind of need a big story like that with some visuals and some recordings to understand how the sort of backroom business just of politics to knock is the stuff, Just to knock the stuffing out of our increased faith in the political system to solve our problems. <laughs> well, there's, well, there's all of that, right? There's how that then plays back through trust and confidence in institutions, which again is a yeah. minor obsession of yours and mine. So that's kind of obvious, right? That there's there's implications that way. But it's sort of, I guess, the rareness of the 60 Minutes episode was uh, was getting, uh, well, getting it getting it on tape for what it's, you know, for want of a better term, getting some of this conduct filmed, mm. getting some of these messages, sort of recorded messages. And how, uh, yeah, that, so just on that, I, I haven't been a journalist for a long time, but I thought you couldn't do that. <laughs> the secret taping well, and the part... secret filming. So what's gone on there? And like, I don't well, get this twelve-month investigation. Like, so and there's a bit of noise in the chat, and we'll we'll just stay on this for a moment because it is the story of the day. But is this a sign that nine is changing the culture of fair? Like, I guess there's one is is this a hit on labour? B can yeah. you justify a twelve-month investigation for kind of a no-name Victorian power broker? And C where's the recordings come from and is that okay i know i've loaded that up well Let's knock it all over in, so we can get into the poll sure well look in terms of is it a story yes it is a story and i think it's uh never mind we'll, we'll come to the sort of mysteries of how the footage was obtained in a second and that's obviously the source of a lot of conversation around the corridors here but is it a story well yes it is a story and i think uh it's 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 interesting that Obviously, Somurek in the power structure of Labor had grown such a formidable figure that uh, it required, you know, a major sting operation in mm. order to bring his his enterprise undone. And three and ministers resign now over it. So well, I'm not right. saying it's nothing. Yeah. Oh no, no, no! I know you're not saying it. You, you're just bringing, Peter. What you're bringing to this is a, is an historical perspective, which which says often lacking sometimes in the analysis of these things. I understand for people like you and me who have kicked around this stuff for a long period of time, the, the, the temptation is, oh, that's just custom and practice in politics, shrug, move on, right? Um, I think, uh, you know, a deep dive like this, look, Somirek is certainly unknown in, in, in terms of, you know, the national sphere and, uh, and probably unknown outside Labor politics. I take that point. But he's formidable in the in the power structure of the Victorian ALP. Yeah. He's he's basically crashed through a sort of a twenty year old stability pact between the right and left in the state, refashioned the right, and that's had fairly significant ramifications in the state and 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 therefore federally, right? So he's a player, uh, and in terms of bringing those practices to light, well, it is in the public interest because, uh, you know the. If people, if those practices are put before people, I think we can all agree that they're that they're pretty unsavoury, right? And that politics should really be about more than the accrual of power by individuals. So, I think it's in the public interest in terms of how they got the material. Well, that is very intriguing. Uh, there has been uh, there's some footage from the 60 Minutes program, which is clearly obtained from a federal MP's office. A um, lot of talk around here about how that came to pass. Also, uh, it's been noted around the corridors here that a lot of the 
uh, the footage that was aired by 60 Minutes is, is broadcast quality. It's not, um, you know, sort of furtive, you know, like I'm sitting here in this very poorly lit, you know, kind of cave in my guardian office. It's, you know, they're, 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 they're high quality images that have, mm. obvi that have obviously been shot on decent equipment. So then, you know, again, I, this is all speculation. I absolutely underline that. This is complete speculation. Uh, but, you know, were, were, the, were police or IBAC already engaged in an investigation of this guy? was you know are any of these messages that were picked up is that part of any uh investigation that was warranted for example um all of these questions have been doing the rounds in the corridors here now i don't have any answers to those questions but it's certainly been engaging uh labor mps around the water cooler for want of a better term mm. and thanks to jane for reminding us all of the great books shane maloney from the um 90s <laughs> this was new yeah. there's Although this isn't the Guardian Book Club, that was last week. Um, no, 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 a shout out to Shane Maloney is always in order. Yeah. So just before we dive into the, um, the polling, has it shaped what this week's going to be in, in federal parliament, in your view, or is it kind of just noise? Oh, I think it's look. I think it's a, it's a big noisy bang at the start of the week. It'll linger around uh, until the shape of the intervention in Victoria is decided by the national executive, which should I, th I think either really be today or tomorrow, um, and then it just goes into the process of a police investigation and an IBAC investigation and then an internal investigation as to what needs to happen in that branch. You know, I don't think we'll be sitting here in a week's time still talking about this, uh, but it was certainly a sort of dramatic opening to the week. Mm. And it sort of come also, um, you know, for folks who've been with us for the last few weeks, um, you know, uh, Peter and I have been talking about the dismount, uh, sort of getting back to the government again, right? We, we're, we're at a point where the government is uh, preparing the public for uh, what's going to happen over the next weeks and months, which is that the the income support, the the support that's been given to people throughout the COVID crisis is going to be wound back. Uh, so the government is talking about that, but it hasn't really happened yet, apart from the the childcare sector, which you know I'm doing a not very subtle segue to the poll here, Peter. Yeah, but, I think it's um, time, isn't it? As you talk, I will do my, my, my awkward screen share. So you keep going yeah, and we'll get the yeah. poll up. And well, I'm just sort of framing the whole, the questions that we, we ran through uh, the polling this week. And that's, we ran these questions because, you know, this is the big germane story in national politics really is, is how uh, the, uh, we've, we've sort of had a very, very intensive burst of activity over the last several months of the Morrison government managing the coronavirus crisis. And that has taken every ounce of their collective focus, attention, effort, energy, all of that sort of stuff to manage the crisis. Um, we're now in this interregnum where um, we've, we've flattened the curve of infections. Hopefully we will not get a substantial second wave, but who knows, no one knows the answer to that question, whether that will happen or not. And the government is setting up the public mm. for the withdrawal of income support and fiscal support across the board. Uh, and the government hasn't withdrawn it yet, but it's trying to soften the public mm. up for that eventuality. All right, so we'll have a look at our first chart, which we sort of kick off every week, which is the longitudinal on government performance and satisfaction is holding 72% at very good or quite good. Um, John Remington, our chief geek, will tell us if there's been any shift in partisan, but I think I know the answer before. It's still pretty solid, John. Yeah, so um, as we've seen for the past few weeks, everything's been pretty consistent as the, um, obviously the country's got used to the conditions we're living under, and that stayed the same with that partisan. So support, general support from Labour Greens, but the bulk of the very good results are coming from those coalition voters. Yeah. A little bit of noise in the states, but nothing significant. WA is a small sample, so to go from 85 to 77 is hardly um, grounds for an internal party review. But um, <laughs> anything stand out there? I think Queensland's the one we've all been watching just because yeah. they're the ones facing a state election, and that's still pretty solid up there. Regard, and they are getting the full court press, even from Canberra, aren't they, Catherine? Yeah, Hayes? that's right. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, Queensland, because it, it's sort of uh, it's, it's it's noisier, as you say, because um, there's actually a partisan 
uh, contest playing out there ahead of the state election. And, uh, but yeah, and the, the Commonwealth, despite being in a sort of constructive phase with the states through the rebooted national cabinet, the old COAG, uh, where everybody, all the premiers and Morrison are gonna sit around telling tales and hugging it out apparently, um, uh, the Morrison is still giving uh, Queensland in particular the rounds of the kitchen about things like the borders, the border closures and other things. So uh, I think, you know, that kind of um, level of public acclamation for the strategy is, uh, you'd be pretty pleased with that if you're Anastasia Palaszczuk, I would have thought. Mm. There is risk and reward in Morrison going into the partisan attacks, isn't there? And he's still dressing it up in terms of federal state, you know, argy-bargy rather than all out. But some of his backbenchers, I'd never heard the name Amanda Stoker before, but she had a crack. Um, and there's been a, there, you can see it starting to build. And is, is there a feeling that there's, particularly on the right of the Liberal and Nationals, these guys that have been held back now for three months ready to blow and maybe go a little bit over the top? Well, it's sort of, it's an interesting thought because um, we have been in a period of politics uh, where the, where tribalism and hyper, you know, hyper partisanship has been dialed right down. Everybody has made a, a real effort uh, at doing that. And you're right, maybe it's sort of like maybe the elements of the right wing of the Liberal Party are like the kind of whistling kettles, you know, they're, they're sort of, uh, they, they, they need, you know, they need some sort of a, I don't know, break out in order to, uh, you know, sort of stop the lid from blowing off or whatever. I don't know. Possibly that's that's true. That would require sort of, I feel not qualified to diagnose whether or not that's the case. But anyway, it is. Who is? It's possible. Yeah. It's possible. Um, yeah. Also, I mean, there is this dynamic, uh, like in all seriousness, um, was a couple of things here. Uh, I gather there's sort of... Um, uh, there, there may be pre-selections coming up in Queensland, so various people are playing to their constituencies in order to be not bumped off by, you know, other other figures who, you know, want someone to be more bolshy or whatever else. So there's there's, there's that dynamic. Um, but there is this sort of, um, you know, identity play in the government um, that we've sort of seen coming to the fore over the last few weeks. We've been talking in these forums, I think, we've, we've referenced the fact that, um, you know, the, the backbench is getting a bit mouthier in general um, about uh, about all kinds of stuff, but particularly the level of of the of the fiscal intervention here. Mm. There are sort of in more ideological quarters of the backbench, there's a push on to try and wind this support back pronto. Um, and uh, so Morrison's under some internal pressure to do that, which is part mm. of the reason for the current signalling. Um, it's all Well, let's have a look at some of those dynamics. So it's quite a wordy question, isn't it? Um, but sometimes you've got to put the facts in front of people, don't you, John, to get, to get, a, get a valid response. But this was in the context of withdrawing JobKeeper for childcare. Um, mm. So... I think the number you led on in your Guardian piece today was the 64% um, figure, which is the number yes. of people that fear that business and jobs are at risk, particularly in the wake of a second outbreak. Yeah. Um, then we've got, yeah. um, and then we've got a bit of a mixed message. 55% say it's too soon to withdraw support for childcare, but 57 say it's the right time to start to remove government funding for some. So that's a bit of a, mm. you know, a licorice all sorts. And there's something for everyone in those numbers, isn't there? <laughs> well, it just sort of goes to prove that, you know, humans by nature are contradictory characters. You know, I certainly am. Mm. And I imagine the good, honest poll respondents uh, yeah. in this sample are similar, right? It sort of doesn't, ha I, I know on the face of it, it looks entirely contradictory. It kind of makes your head explode. Um, but it's sort of not, uh, not not in some ways. There would be people, I'm sure, out in the community who have a, a free-floating anxiety about the reckoning after COVID, just call it yeah. that, right? That, that they'll be worried about their own security of employment. They'll be worried about how on the hook the, you know, debt, the, racket, the Commonwealth racking up debt and deficit you know, Australians are economically conservative in terms of where the centre of gravity in the country is. There will be mm. some concern about that, right? That's just sort of free floating in the back of your mind. 
oh god you know this this will be all it'll be bad on the other side of this it'll be bad for me potentially it'll be bad for the country but then also to be i suppose uh well to, to have enough understanding about the complexities of living through a pandemic to also understand that withdrawing support too early could have catastrophic yeah. consequences for businesses and, and for individuals. And I think there's also a sense of general and specific here. So while you yeah, exactly. can talk about the general idea of removing once you layer it down into a specific industry, that support yeah. dissipates. And that, that's an ongoing problem for government that you can, you can think that you've got permission through generalities, but when you do the specific, that's when people start circling the wagons, yeah? Exactly. Well, that's, uh, and this is why, you know, you and I have been going on about this dismount for weeks. It's really, this, uh, well, this period coming up for Morrison will be extremely testing in all kinds of ways. Now, uh, because as you say, it's one thing to build a case playing into pre-existing sensibilities about concern about debt and deficit and being on being on the fiscal hook for all this stuff right you can obviously push those buttons in terms of political messaging you can get people nodding in their lounge rooms oh yes we don't want to be on the hook for all of this support in general terms but then as you say if you when you move into the specifics when you move into particular industries when you move into particular levels of income support that people may be currently accessing then it becomes much harder to actually prosecute and win those arguments. It's very easy as a government to give people stuff. It is extremely difficult to take it from them once you've given it to them. Sorry, I just went on to mute because there's noise downstairs. Um, second lot of slides we've got here. 53% um, see this as a broken promise. Do you think, you know, it's, is that going to be a valid line of attack for Labor at the moment, broken promises? Or do you think the idea of changing positions is kind of the new operating principle and there's not much there? Uh, well, it's sort of, um, Labor is certainly picking that up and starting to prosecute it as, as part of a general message frame, which is that, um, you know, this, this guy, the Prime Minister, you know, talks a big game but can't always be trusted to follow through on statements or commitments or whatever else. That's just part of a, a, I suppose, a picture that you are attempting to paint of your opponents. And and the best, you know, the kind of best people in politics, the most effective practitioners in politics always define their own agenda, but take every opportunity also to define their opponents. It's, you know, it's kind of part of the being an exemplar of the art form you do that right um but as you say um there's there's some difficulties with it um in the sense of um that sort of uh, full frontal oppositionism if that's even a word so taking taking things on specifically like that you know that's a broken promise you know you're you know you've said one thing you've done another um all of that's valid uh, but it also heralds the return of politics as usual from the from the point of view of of the public. And uh, I think what, one of the fascinating fascinating things about this crisis is that we've seen people enjoying a holiday from pub, from politics as usual. Right? They've seen uh, institutions, uh, individuals acting more or less competently and more or less in their interests, and with a lot of the noise, extraneous noise, dialed down. And people have, uh, people have, uh, people have enjoyed that as far as we've been able to measure that through our through through these polls, Peter. Right. Mm. So when you start to turn it up, when you st when you start to turn up the accountability um, type enterprise of opposition, which inevitably means, you know, you broke your promise, you said one thing and did another, you know, people can't trust you, etc. It might be a valid line of argument, but it also tells people, sends a big signal to the public that we're back into the biff. Yeah. And so it's, it's more fraught than it seems, I think. I'm going to come up for air for a bit because we spent a bit of time in... I, I, I'm, I'm interested, as you know, I'm, in, I'm an interested observer and people know that I'm on the Labor side of politics. Um, it's been a hard period in opposition. I'm, I'm interested in your 
has there been anything specifically you go, yeah, that was a good act of opposition in a difficult environment? I'm sorry to throw that to you at the top of your head and maybe no, no. you want to use no, the no. chat. No, no, no. It's an, it's, a, it's an interesting thought. I mean, I think, um, like, just I'm just speaking now as a citizen, mm. I suppose, rather than a journalist, right? Because I'm just going to... I, I just have to respond off the cuff to what you've, you've given me, right? As a citizen... Um, I am grateful uh, in in the crisis that we've had um, that uh, that everybody has um, been able to rise to the occasion, the government, Labor, and by rising to the occasion, which gets to the point of oppositionism, right, I think uh, myself, Albanese has struck quite a good balance through this crisis of um being constructive but not um Compliant. not subservient yeah. right like i think he's sort of done quite a good job of um setting up arguments down the track if that makes sense right without but but sometimes having the wisdom to defer the argument in the moment um and there's sort of more art in that than i think people might realize um I think probably for progressive supporters, they might think Albanese has been a bit recessed in this crisis, that he's pulled back a bit too much or that he's struggling to articulate what Labor is about. And I mean, all of those are valid enough criticisms. But I think actually, from my vantage point, which is very close in, I think he's done, he and the, the opposition team have done quite a reasonable job of setting things up for uh, well, setting up a setting up battles, setting up core battles for down the track, and I think that's a bit of enlightened oppositionism mm. in the current climate. Understanding that people are sick of the biff, don't don't like you know the kind of conflict all the time surrounds down conflict. It sort of changes it it changes what opposition is about really in those yeah. periods. If that and makes look, sense. And I've asked you about the coalition backbench what's the vibe on the labor backbench it, is there a sense of unity in the moment or is there a sense that there's some people ready to break loose there and go a little bit harder i think it's uh look i think in general um you know obviously it ebbs and flows in any political movement kind of sentiment ebbs and flows morale ebbs and flows um i think uh, people are obviously on the labor side still coming to terms with the fact that they lost the last federal election, which in their minds is an election they should have won. Um, and that is, that's very difficult to process in your mind that for whatever reason you threw away an election that you think you should have won. So that's a polite way of me saying people are not thrilled with life at the moment. People are mm -hmm. not sort of kicking back and thinking, wow, isn't it great to be back here in another term of opposition? Um, they're not thinking that. They're, they're dealing with various stages of, of, of grief and regret. Um, and so that's, um, that's never a... <laughs> that's, that could be a combustible environment, is what I'm trying to say. So, um, and there's obviously a lot of focus around uh, the result in the Eden Monero by-election. Um, you know, it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty important contest um, for... I just think in terms of Labor's internal equilibrium, uh, it'll be quite difficult for Anthony Albanese if Labor loses that by-election. So um, it may bring some frustrations to the fore. Now, I mean, I would hope that Labor has the kind of equanimity and attention span to not, you know, lose its, lose its mind in the event that it uh, doesn't prevail in this by-election. But who knows? I think that's an open question at this point. Mm. Um, feel free to, you. there's a lot of comment in the chat, very few questions at this stage, so you're not passing the Q&A test, gang, although um, Sophie has made a really good suggestion that we do test Morrison's language on belt tightening in next week's report, John, and I, I think that's a real, you know, one of the things Morrison does really well is talk in these kind of, some would say cliches, others would say word pictures, but we've had the 
we've been on the what is it the ICU and now we've got to get off the ICU and now <laughs> oh we've been on various things we've been on bridges um <laughs> oh that's right we've been <laughs> like, still on the bridge I, huh? I can't remember I tend to for my own sanity and this is a you know this is a, a particularly uh, you know sharp criticism against Morrison it's just this is these are, uh, politicians use this language word pictures whatever mm -hmm. else I find for my sanity, I have to screen some of the metaphors out of my brain. Otherwise, you know, my head hurts. Um, yeah. But we have, uh, we've been on a lot of different journeys in this pandemic. Yeah. Like, you know, ICUs, bridges, um, mountains, um, you know, you name it, we've been on it. So um, the, the, the question though, of course, the most germane question all along is how we get off it. Yeah. And as someone that loves messaging, I've always noticed Morrison's very iterative. He'll try anything. He sort of runs this rolling focus group and still something hits. And the number of, before the last election, the number of iterations of trying to make Bill into a slogan, it was just incredible. Because, you know, there was the unforgettable and the mm. unaffordable. Mm. And it was, mm. like, mm. was kind of like, I think he stumbled on the bill you can't afford and there you have it and there goes the election. Um, <laughs> Let's just ju jump into uh, one other slide and then we're going to move to our special subject for the day. God help you all who aren't aficionados on unions. But anyway, um, the protests in America, I think we've caught, the, it feels like the kids in America, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> following the protests in the United States of America, there have been demonstrations in Australia um, to oppose the deaths of Indigenous people in police custody. To what extent do you disagree or agree with the following statement? And so 84% kind of are with the idea that this was a risk, but 62% justified, but 61 sort of a bit, I wouldn't say with Morrison, but the idea that the situation is very different in America to Australia. So what do you make of that little sort of internal well, schizophrenic yeah, well, dialogue? Well, no, it's kind of interesting. Like the sort of minor theme of the day has been, you know, the, the basic inconsistency of humans. And here we are with a basic inconsistency of humans again. Although I wasn't surprised by this particularly because if you were with us last week, you'll remember that we ran some questions uh, just around racism and institutional racism off the back of the sad uh, death of George Floyd in the United States. And what we discovered in those questions last week is that people in Australia, at least in our sample, um, have no trouble accepting that institutional racism exists in the US, but can't but are divided about whether institutional racism exists in Australia. We recognise it elsewhere, we don't necessarily recognise it close to home. So that to me um, explains that 61% figure that's kind of consistent with what the inform or what we learned in last week's survey mm -hmm. that uh, Australians are not sold on the fact that institutional racism exists here and that we see things in the States is quantifiably different, different to being to, to events at home, even though in, on some measures we're actually worse than the States. But anyway, setting that to one side, that's just a matter of perception. In terms of the rest of it then just makes sense to me, right? Mm. I think you would be hard pressed if you just walked out onto the street with a microphone and did a vox pop to find anyone saying that having a mass protest event in the middle of a pandemic is, a, is consistent with the health advice or is a good mm. idea. I mean, obviously we know what the health advice says and it is like, it's just objectively not a good idea to have a mass protest in the middle of a pandemic. And given that we've ridden this journey, which we, we've tracked, well, you, Peter and John have tracked so successfully through this poll series, in Australia, for, you know, in terms of the COVID thing, we sort of started up out thinking it was a total beat up and, you know, all kind of nonsense and, you know, nothing to worry about. Then we became very worried about it. And we've also, by and large, been very responsive to public health messaging, right? The mm -hmm. messages have got through and by and large, the public has complied with them. So I'm not at all surprised that 84% of this sample think that protests in a pandemic are a bad idea. I'm, I'm however, gratified in this sample to see that 62% actually recognise that we do have a problem uh, in Australia with institutional racism and understand the nature of the cause and why the Indigenous leadership, you know, took the risk of protesting during the pandemic. So I reckon in a funny way, even though it's contradictory, it makes perfect sense to me, Peter, which might just be because I'm Irish, I don't know, but it makes perfect sense to me.
John, are there any interesting cross tabs just on those three numbers? Um, yeah, be uh, I think, intention? yeah, I think Catherine made a good point earlier. And with the statements we ran about the job keeper and the early child learning, we are seeing the uh, a return to partisan results there. So strong, um, as you might expect with some of the statements we asked in some case, there was a big divide between the coalition <coughs> voters and Labour and Greens. Similar thing with um, these results as well. We're seeing some strong partisan lines, um, not so much with the figure about um, putting the community at risk with 84%, that's pretty much consistent throughout. But in terms of the um, protest as being justified, we're seeing Labour and Greens voters more likely to say, agree with that statement, or less so coalition. And we also see an age difference as well. We've got 69% of younger people, those aged 18 to 34, saying that the protesters are justified with what they're doing, and that's down near 56% when you look at those aged over 55. And obviously we didn't get in a chance. James, I think, breathing a sigh of relief, we didn't ask about gone with the wind and faulty towers. I don't know <laughs> if the world needs those questions. I suspect we'll get, um, I don't know where we go with that. Um, but I am interested in the monuments issue for next week. I, I think it's a really interesting, uh, not because, because I think it is a flashpoint for culture wars and we need to know where the sides line up before anyone wants to embark on that. Um, I'm not sure if a Captain Cook statue is different to a statue of a slave trader or not. And I know there's really complex debates behind that and I'm interested in where the public is on that. So maybe we can slip some something like that in for next week, John. But we'll, we'll spare James gone with the wind and Chris Lilly, I just think. Probably that's, <laughs> a, that's the bridge too far. Um, so is there anything coming through in the chat that we want to call people up to? I know there's just, it, it, it's a very opinionated room today. We're not asking questions and that's fine. Um, we might just keep going and then have a bit of a free for all at the end if people are okay with that. Look, the last set of questions we're going to do today is a special subject of both Catherine and mine, which has almost become a genre in progressive politics, which is unions and what and why and where are they going. And we're in this really interesting moment and we were interested in people's um, views um, on whether this moment where there seems to have been a rapprochement and an end of the, you know, the, the war between the coalition, the unions, or at least a ceasefire, whether that has had a material difference. I've just stuck a piece up on Guardian and maybe Asta can chuck that in the chat if anyone's interested. It sort of was a little bit late to um, have any meaningful impact on this discussion, but I'll just go into the, um, and hope they've done the right, screen share this time guys sorry about last time so 10 percent of respondents and this is say they are union members which is kind of within the margin of error i think the number's always really hard even to get a hard number on on density catherine just you know when we i was i was industrial reporter on the telly in a, the mid 90s and i think you started on the fin in the late 90s when union density was still sort of close to 40, between 40 and 50%. Yeah, um, yeah. when we started, yep, for it's sure. And a fast yeah. journey down and, you know, I argue that's probably a mixture of structural changes such as, you know, moving to smaller workplaces, casualisation, contracting out, which makes it a much different proposition to organise, mm, but, yeah, yeah. but also a political agenda, but also a political agenda to weaken <laughs> the unions, which we've seen over the last two decades. Yeah, well, it's multifactorial, obviously, the decline in membership. It's, you know, it's sort of the, the end of, um, you know, kind of the male-dominated, um, you know, massive industries of the, of the 80s or, the, or the, change, the, the change in those industries and also the, the change in the nature of work and organisation, as you've said, the trend towards casualisation, gig economy, all of that stuff, um, it makes, it's very hard for unions to organise in that environment, mm. although obviously not impossible. Also, as you say, like everything, you know, unions have been caught up in the polarisation of the public discussion in Australia. Um, and we've sort of had a period where legislatively, like in our reporting lifetimes, uh, obviously during the Howard era, there was a 
a big sort of um, deregulation of uh, the labour market that happened that in in the end cost him his seat and, and cost, cost the coalition government, but all of that happened and that obviously didn't help the capacity of unions to organise. And then on the other side of that, it was, uh, you know, Labor kind of, uh, you know, shifted the needle back more in, in, in some respects that are making the environment easier for unions to represent the interests of working people. But that's, that's been a big dialogue, obviously. And then there's also been a lot of public discussion about unions, uh, you know, particularly during the Howard mm. Reith era and flowing on from that as being, you know, not particularly constructive participants in, you know, in, in national affairs. So there's, as you said, like, that's how you open the conversation. I agree. That's, that's basically the, 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 the one extra bit I think is this, uh, and it's not a simple story, but the criminalization of industrial action has really, it started with the Royal Commission into the building industry, right? Um, yeah. And that, that set a whole lot of straitjackets on building unions that meant that what they did was illegal, which created the, 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 the sort of the, the narrative that it was criminal activity. So there were hundreds of criminal breaches, which are really technical breaches of old industrial laws. But parallel to that, you had the HSU corruption, which was genuine and real, and yeah. led to um, an HSU official, Craig Thompson, actually propping up the Gillard government as a crossbencher. And it was a Effectively, it, it sort of built into that criminal um, corruption narrative. Yeah. And then you ended up with Turk, which was a whole Royal Commission to uncover corruption, which didn't really find anything, but came mm. up with the union integrity laws, which have now been put down by Morrison um, as a consequence of the newfound peace. So it's, it's a really yeah. interesting, you know, 15 yeah, year old journey. Yeah. And so yeah, now yeah. we're in a place. So my point is now we're in, my setup to this whole thing is now we're in a place where, in a way, Unions have been part of the institutional framework that's delivered Australia a really good outcome. Yeah. And, and, and they've kind of regained their social licence in this moment. Yeah. What does that mean? Yeah. And that's kind of the da-da. So the, the questions here, this is the first time, and this is a question we've asked for a long time, overall would workers be better off or worse off if unions in Australia were stronger? It's the first time we've got to 50% um, with that better off narrative. And if you go back to 2012, it was almost line ball, um, mm -hmm. which is quite a remarkable proposition. So mm -hmm. it feels to me that we are in this moment where our friends in the labor movement and full disclosure work for a few of them um, can start sort of doing something other than just fighting the next election as a matter of survival. And, you know, there's big debates at the moment. What is work? Um, you know, how should you set wages and conditions? So it, it's a really interesting moment, I think. Yeah, yeah. And it's and I think um, certainly the leadership of the ACTU have been quite cognizant of that um, and cognizant of the, uh, well, the, not opportunity. They That's not the way to look at it and that's not the way they are looking at it. But this COVID reset, the government has needed organised labour in order to help them manage the economy. That's why unions are back at the table. In the process of unions being back at the table, some uh, decent relationships have formed, particularly between Christian Porter, the IR minister, and Sally McManus at the ACTU. These guys, uh, you know, probably don't have a great deal in common um, outside the, you know, the, their meeting spaces and meeting rooms. But have nonetheless established a rapport. They trust one another, and uh, and they've had you know a, a very productive experience out of managing this crisis. Now, whether or not that leads to um, a set of circumstances that both sides uh, can be comfortable about in terms of what happens next, what happens with the government's reform agenda, and whether or not unions uh, you know can can sort of uh, pony up to that constructively or whether we then retreat to kind of battle stations well we're going to really see that play out in the coming weeks and months um but it's certainly the whole uh, the the whole trajectory of it as you say peter is really quite interesting um how we've ended up at this moment and there certainly is opportunity for organized labor for sure um but i think it's probably slightly more uh, complex than um, sort of spinning out of COVID in a 
in a way that sort of allows you to renew your social license and make a case with the public about why you matter. Um, I think also there's there are broader debates that that will happen as a consequence of this crisis whether or not Australia should re-establish a sort of baseline manufacturing industry mm. for strategic capability. Also, um, you know, concerns people will have around, you know, the very tenuous work arrangements that a lot of people in the modern economy find themselves in, like gig economy workers, for example, right? Like there's quite a number of kind of moving parts here mm. which do represent opportunity for the trade union movement but but you know like in everything also risk right it's it's how you try and position yourself in these big debates that we're going to see over the next little bit yeah the, the question in my mind is whether if we move to effectively a risk mitigation model of government over the next few years is the idea that pandemics can come back whether yeah. there's a recognition hey this is an institution that you can actually then mobilise a section of the workforce, as it's happened with health workers, education yep. workers, um, and whether it's, it almost seems to me that there's kind of opportunity on both sides. If the government could move down that path, I think the natural implication would be that the, the frenetic nature of election campaigns and the anti-government campaigning from unions, like I think unions will always back in Labor, but there's been a bit of a sense, and I've been involved in a lot of these campaigns, that it's been a fight for survival. It hasn't been a mm. fight for the next government. Mm. It's been mm. a fight for the future of the movement. Oh, yeah, so yeah. Well, well, membership now is at, is, at, is genuinely at existential levels. It's sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the decline in union density is such that, uh, you know, that unions will be worried about surviving, not, you know, the, the thinking about prospering is you know, an entirely mm. different thought process, right? Mm. Like they, they will be worried yeah. about surviving. I think the thing is about the coming period is really for both sides, the government and the union movement to establish whether or not there are any deals there to do. And mm. maybe there are, and maybe there aren't. Um, you know, organised labour said a second ago, right? It had to be at the table during this crisis. It was, it was very important there, you know, the, the all of the essential services in this crisis are still sectors that are relatively heavily unionised, right? Um, so as you say, Peter, there's, there's, there's opportunity there on, for both sides, but both sides have got to work out, well, I hate to sort of chuck a Trumpism in this conversation, but the art, the, of the, deal, yeah. the art of the deal, what's the deal? Is there a deal to do? Yeah. Um... Just final couple of slides on statements. These are not to agree, disagree. These are strongly agree and somewhat agree. And they're all adding up to well over 50% actually into the 70s. And these are positive propositions about um, the role unions can, can play. And um, then there's a couple of, I think, negative ones on the next slide. But so, you, you know, unions insisting on minimum qualifications and training create a highly skilled workforce tick. Unions are, to are vital to stop businesses taking advantage of their employees' tick, and so it goes. Um, I think what's interesting is at the same at the same time, you get people agreeing to the negatives as well. Unions are too politically yeah. biased. Um, I think there's a corruption one where it's not over fifty, but it's more than disagreed. Um, so. Again, a sign of a war where you've been hit with heavy propaganda from both sides is that both sets of messages hit and almost cancel each other out. Yeah, well, it's sort of like it, it's the, it's the, yeah, it's that, uh, I suppose unions have been on the, as you say, they've been on the receiving end of negative framing for the best part of two decades. Obviously, you know, those, those messages will permeate consciousness because they're, they're you know, they, they're frequent, the messaging is frequent. And also uh, because everything, again, in, po in politics is so polarised, everybody is sort of manning battles, you know, battle stations on either side. Um, unions sort of, I guess, get caught up in that partisan Bifo, for want of a better term, but then that doesn't necessarily take away from people's own lived experience of their trade union, if that if they have one, right? And I mean, obviously, only a small group of workers in the in the economy now do. But 
you know, if you're a member of a trade union movement, you will know that they have, you know, helped you negotiate your workplace agreement. You'll, you'll have positive mm. practical experiences also to temper with these messages that have, you know, come down the pipe for, you know, a decade or more. So again, I, I don't know, we're doing a lot of, well, I'm doing a lot of understanding about the complexity of the human condition today, Peter. I don't know why. I just feel the need to do that. Well, if nothing else, that's a good, a good thing to spend an hour doing during this time. <laughs> hey, we did have a question from Penelope. She's not sure if she can work her device or not, but are you there, Penelope? Give it a crack. See, your camera's on. No, you haven't got your volume on. Do you want to try to unmute yourself one more time? Otherwise, I'm going to have to lip read you. No, I can see you, but I can't hear you. But Penelope said... Is it not a question of what does a society, we as a society actually know about unions and to what extent are the Hawke Keating years followed by Howard to blame, the former with its relative peace and the latter its partisanship? Mm -hmm. You know, it is true that union membership dropped off the cliff at the height of union power during the Accord when they mm -hmm. were doing amazing things like creating superannuation and um, locking in Medicare while opening up the economy. But this is, but the, but the the key in that sentence is opening up the economy. Um, mm. You know, this is this was sort of a big structural driver of the decline in union membership. Was, you know, the, the decline in blue collar manufacturing um, in Australia, which is a consequence of the Hawke Keating reforms. Another conscious, you know, another another, you know, bequest of the Hawke Keating era in terms of the accord was the suppression of wages too. In the, you know, for the for the national interest of fighting inflation. It's kind of like, it's, it's, again, if you sort of penetrate that story a little bit, you can see why union membership started to decline in that period. It makes sense uh, because of, you know, things, well, both those things that I mentioned and doubtless other things. And the economy has just changed. We've changed from, you know, an economy that sells kind of agricultural mm -hmm. goods and makes stuff into a services economy. And services sectors are harder to organize and then you overlay that with partisanship and and kind of you know blame games and all that sort of stuff and then you've got the situation in which unions currently find themselves mm. we've got a question from kate da costa that is totally in my hitting zone if she wants to step <laughs> up to the plate you there kate oh uh, yeah i am hello uh, is that the government debt question yeah okay so why, um, I don't know if there's polling about it or it just goes along with the general media thing. My observation, I am biased, is that the media tends to give the Liberals a bit of a free run on questions of debt and how they're going to pay for submarines or um, expanding the Olympic Dam or whatever. But if the ALP or the Greens come up with a suggested program, they're obliged to get asked all the time, how will you pay for this? And there's hysteria about debt under the ALP. Mm. Do you want to have first crack and then I will hit it out of the park, Catherine? Well, exactly. I think you I think you were warming up to open your shoulders on that, Peter, weren't you? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, well, quickly, I, I, I will hand the mic back to Peter quickly because <laughs> um, he's itching for it. Um, look, uh, look, as a general proposition, that's, that is... Uh, that's fair. I bristle slightly at the media as a monolith, you know, like there are different voices in the Australian media. But anyway, I accept as a general proposition, it is true. There is this strange double standard uh, where, um, you know, Labor's economic management is, uh, you know, is kind of poured over and the government's not so much. I accept that that is true. Um, but it'll be interesting. I'll just add one quickly, quick thing before Peter... Um, exercises his rights um uh, it will be interesting uh, you know with with this crisis and we've got a long way to go COVID, i mean uh just to see whether or not the government finds itself in a labor problem which is different to the debt question but like for what i mean by that is labor managed the australian economy through the global financial crisis we were one of the few economies not to go into recession in the world and labor got absolutely no credit for that absolutely no credit because when you succeed in a crisis when you when you stop something from happening people don't people don't experience the downside therefore you don't get a lot of uh, you don't get a lot of people patting you on the back it'll be interesting to see whether the government's competent management of covid 
somehow has a negative dividend in the way that uh, uh, with Labor and the GFC. The different issues, but I'm just putting it out there for discussion. Anyway, over to Peter. Well, um, I can't believe I've managed 12 weeks without talking about my favourite polling phenomenon, which is the finger hut effect. And the finger hut effect the, is named after a, the <laughs> finger hut effect. So Vic Finger Hut is a Washington based pollster that's been doing this since the 60s. His first campaign was um, um, Herbert Humphrey. Um, and he's come up with this insight, which has driven a lot of our work over the years, which is anywhere in the Western world, regardless of the merits of the day, if you ask who's better at managing the economy, right of centre parties win at about 60 to 40. Um, regardless of whether the economy is going good, bad or indifferent, coalition always wins or right of centre parties always win who's the better economic manager. If you take the same group, and we've been talking about these internal inconsistencies today, and ask them who is better at managing the economy for ordinary people like you or for people who stands up for your interests, mm. the, number, the same group flips 55-45 towards left of centre parties. So yeah. um, it's... Now, you could say that's because of the way the media handles it, but it is just a given of politics that right of centre parties win on an economic frame and it's a fool errand to try to win uh, and try to change it. The trick is not to say you're a better economic manager, it's to shift the conversation to how the economy works for people. So whether mm -hmm. that, you know, 2007 work choices was actually not just about work choices, it was a reframe about how the economy was working and what it was going to do because it was going to take away your rights from work. Now, I get excited about this because polling often sets up lots of questions, but done well, it can also give you a few hints on how you can be more effective politically. And the insight out of this for the moment is for Labor, as the economic snapback occurs, they can't be trying to win on debt or any of the higher level figures um, with a possible exception of unemployment which needs to be framed around individual jobs and industries and things that people can hold on to. So it seems to me that um, as the dismount occurs, there'll be a lot of really smart people in Labor trying to say, see, you're not such a good economic manager after all. They won't win on that. They've got to be talking about how the economy works for people, how um, issues like housing, issues like early childhood, issues like you know, the next jobs and skills for the next generation. I reckon that's the way through. So thanks for bowling me the full toss there, Kate, because I've been itching to hit that one. We're, we're, we're running down the clock. Um, I've loved the um, interaction on chat today. So thanks for everyone for being involved. Just to remind uh, rest of this week, tomorrow, Jonathan Green's launching the latest edition, The Engine. Um, one of his guests is Alexis Wright, who's book was a subject of um, the book, the Guardian Book Club last Friday. So that'll be a great one. Next week, if you want to come back, we're going to be running 12.30 to 1.30 next Tuesday for the Geek Fest because we're inserting this as part of um, the Progress Conference, which is running two days, Tuesday and Wednesday, which is the annual event that's normally held in Melbourne Town Hall um, by the Centre for Australian Progress, which is one of our project partners. You're all invited to be part of that. You can come to the lunchtime talks for free. If you can fork out a hundred bucks, you can go to the two day conference um, and we will circulate a link to the registration for that conference. There's about 1400 people going and it's a really you know, amazing event. So um, lots of breakouts and workshops. So whether you're a practitioner or just interested in politics, it's a great thing to be part of if you've got the time on your hands. Um, so that's kind of it for today. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Guardian Australia, for being part of this. We've got through 12 weeks, a um, couple more to go, and we'll be on to bigger and better things. But thank you all for your participation today. And see you next time. We've gone the hour. Cheers, guys. See ya.